All right, one more minute. All right, and it's time according to Verizon. So last class, we talked about what happens when you have a periodic system. And basically what uh, Blog did for his PhD thesis, right? So, next slide. So this is Sommerfeld from the Sommerfeld theory. He's also responsible for quantum numbers for some of the quantum numbers. So he's one of the giants in quantum mechanics. And his theory is the one that didn't take into account that there were interactions, right? That was blocked, no, sorry, not interactions, ions in there. But then when you added to this periodic system, the ions, that's where block came in. So the different labels that we have, Sommerfeld was only thinking free electron gas. So he only needed one quantum number for the labels, this wave vector K. But block needs to have two, not just the wave vector, but also the band that you're in. So that little N means what band you're in. Unfortunately, we don't have enough letters. So a little N shows up for everything. That's one of the most used letters in physics. So we're looking at H bar times K times the wave vector, you get the momentum, right? So that's for the free particles, you have momentum, normal momentum. And uh, when you have something inside of a crystal, the same quantity, the wave vector times the Planck constant H bar gives you a crystal momentum. So it's not exactly momentum, it's the momentum inside the crystal. Okay? Almost the same, but not exactly. So then your energy is proportional to the wave vector squared here. Your energy depends on the band that you're in and it can take on different shapes. So adding the atoms made it so that this thing is not as simple as this one over here. So you see that the dependence is both in this wave vector and this G is the vector for the periodicity of the system. So that G points in directions that are periodic. How much do you have to move and in what direction? How much G is in what directions, in the different directions that you have, how much do you have to move so that you're back in the same place in the periodic lattice? Okay? So G uh, is just an offset? Yep. Kind of like an offset, kind of like big R that we had previously for the lattice, Rabe's lattices. G is exactly like that, but for the K wave vector. So when this was, imagine that you had another quantity that varied with position, right? And you had the little R for position, that's the equivalent of this K. And then we had a big R because he was the periodicity of the system. In this case, this G plays the same thing, but in crystal momentum space. So that's what the big G is. And then your because this is a free electron gas are just plane waves with a normalization constant. So in the periodic system, you have a plane wave times this periodic function that depends on N up there and wave vector. So this modulation that you get from the crystal periodicity, right? So that's what we cover in the previous class and how to get there. Questions? Uh, I... And I'm posting these lectures on the web so you can see them again if you need to. Okay. So this red one is the free electron gas with the K square. This is K, that's energy. And then we see that 
at low energies, they're the same, but then this blue one goes like this and opens up at this value pi over A is a particular important value because A is the periodicity of the lattice, right? So when we get to this pi over A value, your, um, at this point, and then um, in this case, I'm giving you a representation that is um, taking this periodic lattice that would continue. So this blue line would continue. So this blue line would continue in this direction, but over here and go like that. And it's this orange line that got displaced from over here to here. So you actually get those two bands in there. So let me show you that picture better. All right, hold on. We talk about Fermi surfaces. This is the Fermi surface for the free electron gas where we're building it out. This is just one of the quadrants of this for the sphere, right? But we're building it up of these little blobs. And then when you get to a high enough value, it starts looking like a sphere. So the free electron gas looks like a sphere. This is sodium. So sodium has this uh, group one element, metallic, right? You guys have seen sodium probably before. No, so it's squishy metal. Maybe you've seen videos of it and it gets cut with a knife. So that sodium, elemental sodium in metal form looks like that, like a sphere, almost like a sphere. I don't know if you can tell, but it, it's kind of like squished in here a little bit, but it's almost a spherical. And that's because sodium, as well as all of the group one elements are kind of like the noble metals of the, of the, in that they're just giving up one electron. So that one electron behaves like if it was a free Fermi gas. But then we look at aluminum or aluminum, depending on what side you're on, right? It's over there is group three. And you see that this is the Fermi surface for aluminum that looks a lot different. So it's not a sphere anymore. This is all of the yellow things. And then you have the purple things that are separated from it. Like you see here, they're like little pockets where electrons live. So at particular K values, electrons leave, leave there, they like to stay there. And then you have like, for instance, between this K value and this K value is empty of electrons. But then you have another little pocket of electrons right here. So this is what aluminum free Fermi surface looks like. And it's very different from the sphere of the free Fermi gas. All right. So this is the thing I was going to tell you. How do, how do we get the picture that I have back over here? Let's go back here. So this is the extended sum version of it. So you see this is chi over pi. And this should be A here. But this thing that I copied it from didn't have the A. So the black line, the black line is the block version. And then there's the dash line that goes here. There's a dash line right here. That would be the K square version. And you see that this black one follows almost exactly except this near this boundary right here and near this boundary here. So this is in one dimension, very simple. We just have the Dirac uh, delta position at A, 2A, 3A, infinite collection of those. Solve that. And then we get that the energy dispersion is not the K-square one that you see in the dashed line right here, but it's actually this one. So you see it here, the dashed line versus this black one, right? So now what happens is that you get this opening of the gap, opening of a gap that there's no state that can be occupied in the black line right here. Same thing over here. So you see this line goes up here, the black one bends a little bit this way. And then the dashed line continues through here, but then there's a black line right here, up here. And it's the same in this, this symmetric, right? 
So now what I can do is take this line right here, leave it there, then take this line right here that goes from here to here, grab it, dump it on this end, because this is periodic, right? So this one right here became this one. And this line right here became this one. Can you guys visualize that? Just dumping it from here to there. Cosmo? Yeah. All right, perfect. And then this one right here, right? This is also periodic. And this one got dumped here. And then this one right here gets dumped over here. And you get this little cone down here. This separation right here is the same separation as here. Then this separation right here is the same separation of that. So this is the extended zone where there's just this line going here, one of them, and it almost goes like that. There's the periodicity here in K space. Here, we're just putting it in this reduced zone. It just means that we're putting everything that was over here in the first one. So call this one the first zone, second zone right here, third zone right here. And we're basically translating all of them into the first one. And it's periodic, so you can do that. And then this is if I took this one and copied it from the first zone into the second zone and the third zone, so forth. So this is the repeated zone, repeated zone, zone approach. So now this show us how we could do that same thing with the Sommerfeld free electron gas, right? And it would look like this, except it wouldn't have this gaps, this line would attach to this line and so forth. But for the crystal ones with the periodicity of the crystal in there, we see that there's this periodic structure that gets repeated. Or if we just wanna display one, it looks like this. So this is the band structure of that system. A lot of the work that we do in condensed matter physics is about band structure. This would be the band structure for that one dimensional periodic system where you just have Dirac deltas at uh, position. So if you make the potential more complicated, you're solving the same problem, but it's more complicated potential, you'll get whatever material you have. That's how you will get the pictures that you see in papers in other places. So I think that this is the most, one of the most important concepts. And it's actually where most of the physicists that don't like condensed matter would say like, it doesn't make any sense and uh, just dismiss condensed matter. So you might have heard people saying like, oh, condensed matter sucks or something, right? Well, it's because they don't understand this thing and they didn't put the effort to understand what's happening here. And it has different, difficulties from other concepts in physics, right? Like in optics, you don't get to see this K-space representation. Um, high energy physics, they don't care about band structures, things like that, because they're working in a single particle version. So this is where it gets different. And some people don't like it because it's different. And other people see this and think like, wow, this is so cool. Now I understand what's happening. So I hope you're in the second range and that uh, you're able to follow this. This is not too complicated. It's just that it has this concept. That now you're in this K space as compared to other places. You're just living in momentum world at this point. Questions? All right, so now you see how these pictures get made for the very simple systems, right? This right here is a calculation I did. This is the, the a unit cell for this system right here. And it has this one on this on the left. It has that uh, periodicity of the system. So if I take this atom 
this atom is also in this corner, this corner, and this corner. So now you see how this gets peri periodic in the space, right? So it would look like that. That's silicon. That would be the unit cell of silicon, which is in the zinc blend structure, which is two silicon, two uh, face center cubic lattices, one displaced from the other. So that's why there's so many atoms here. This one is different than that. If this is cubic structure. This is not cubic. You can see that there's an angle here. So this is a hexagonal structure. And here we see one atoms. One atom is joined to three atoms like this, and they form bonds with each other. So now these two bonds right here are two atoms that are above. And then this third bond is not shorter, right? So there's two bonds up here in this direction. And then the bond that is behind it is coming down from below. So it's something that has a structure that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's how this one looks like this. So that's the, in real space, that's where the atoms are. You can see the symmetries of the system. Basically here, you can see the unit cell, cubic, hexagonal, and so forth. Questions? So if we look at the band structure, this guy right here is the same one, the blue one that I showed you before, right here, right? And is this one right here. And this is the band structure for the system. So here is my K space. Now this labels is gamma, K, L, W, all of that is just positions in K space, in the momentum space, directions in momentum. And then here we have an energy. And you see that this material right here has, this thing looks almost quadratic right here, but inverse quadratic. And here it looks also quadratic in the black one, but not these two guys, right? So that's the band structure of the system. So what I can tell you from looking at this system is that it has a band gap, right? There's a particular energy. So we go from here. This is an energy where you have filled states. At this point, when you look up, you see that there's an energy, a particular energy where this thing doesn't uh, allow electrons to be. Questions? So this makes it a semiconductor. If you look at the energy versus momentum, there's a gap of energy states right here. This gap is about one electron volt, and that's why that's a semiconductor. So that means that there's no electrons that can live in this region right here. Uh, I think this is the same. Yep. So basically everything below this gray line, which is just to show you where zero is, is a valence band. Everything above is a conduction band. And then I can grab this and integrate in directions so that I only start counting how many, how much at this particular energy, how many states I have by integrating like that. I come up with this picture right here. So it's the same band structure, but now I added this um, integrated all of the energy states and I get this just as a function of energy, how many states I have. So this right here, I should have put a label right here. If this is just counting states at a particular energy. So this plot right here is the density of states. So this is, for instance, something like uh, what Dr. McElroy can measure. This kind of how big is this gap in his lab? He can tell you how much this grows like this. XPS. XPS, exactly. You work with him? Yes. All right, so this is something that he can measure this side of the graph. This one has more information because it has direction too. So I integrated all of the direction and I have the energy density of states right here. Yeah. Yep. 
everything is energy in this direction, up, down. So this is the zero of energy. The zero is put where this line, the valence band is, stops. Yep. So you can see that there's no states right here up to about one electron volt of energy and then you have more states over here. So that means that you have no, at this energy, there are no electrons available. And you can see that there's a lot of electrons starting from this energy and they go all the way to here. There's a lot of electrons that you can use for, con that you can use in your valence band. And the same thing for conduction, right? Except they start right here and they have all of this conduction electrons right here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's just negative, right? But the zero is kind of imaginary. We put the zero where the valence band stops. So this is my energy. At negative one electron volt, we're probably around here. And I can tell you how many electrons I have. And at zero is basically gonna to go to zero. And at one positive is gonna start growing again. And that, that's called the band gap for semiconductors or metals too. Except metals don't have a band gap, right? And uh, insulators, the band gap is just way bigger. So if this distance right here was not one electron volt, this distance in the yellow, but rather maybe five electron volts. So if the gap started uh, finish over here, then you have a good insulator. For instance, diamond, the band gap is around nine electron volts. Diamond is a really good insulator. All right, so these are the calculations that we do, that we're able to do in my group, figuring out where electron states live and where the electrons like to be. And this is what certain groups do and measure. Like for instance, McElroy's group look at this, looks at this density of states. So this is platinum. And it's the same idea. I put the platinum lattice in my computer, use density functional theory to calculate the solve the quantum mechanical problem, right? That you have electrons in this box that are periodic, that have atoms in these positions. The atoms interact with each other and have this potential Coulomb interaction with the electrons, right? And then I let the computer solve it. And then it gives me this as a function of momentum direction. So this is gamma, gamma x, w, l. As a function of momentum direction at what energy are electrons leaving? And what is the energy of those electrons? So if we look at this one, this is platinum, this is a metal. You see that there's no band gap. Like for instance, this purple line continues here all the way up to here, and then it comes down again. So that means that there's no bang up, there's electron states everywhere. And that's what makes this a metal. Does that make sense? There's no bang up, electrons can live at whatever energy. Make sense? Um, Right, exactly. If you're above five electron volts, you're usually called a, an insulator. If you're between three and five electron volts, you're called a wide band gap semiconductor. So that's platinum. This is iron. Iron is actually a special, right? So iron is... Um, metal, so its band structure would look like this one for iron. So what I did in, what I drew here is not the band structure, but actually the density of states. So it's the thing that I showed you before that it was integrating everything in momentum space. But iron is special, it's 26 in the periodic table. 
And it's special because it has uh, up and down electrons that are not the same number. So that's why iron is a, is a magnetic metal. So what I'm plotting here is that the band structure would be different for up electrons, which are purple, versus down electrons, which are in this bluish color. Since the, there's a difference between those two, this is magnetic. In all the other ones, they would be identical, whether you're up and down electrons, because they have the same number of up and down. But this guy has a different numbers of up and down, so therefore the density of state looks different. And when you're at uh, this value right here, for instance, right here, you can see that there's more purple than bluish ones. So here there's more purple than bluish. Here there's more bluish than purples. So that's why this guy is magnetic because he has more of one than the other at a particular energy. Make sense? So I could do the same thing with cobalt. Cobalt is also magnetic. And I would get something similar to this and I can evaluate how much difference is between up and down spins and tell you how good of a magnet this is. For non-magnet, you can do, uh, I guess, uh, uh, -huh. overlap. Exactly, they're exactly the same. So if I looked at the platinum one, which I didn't do here, it would look exactly the same. These are different because they're different materials. They're different for up and down in this material. Um, there's another thing I wanted to show you. This is iron oxide. You guys have seen iron oxide. If you have anything made out of iron, it's gonna have iron oxide on the top. So iron oxide, uh, let's see. All right, so this is the, the same thing, density of states, except I, do, I use two different theories for iron oxide. I calculated one with DFT, which is this blue one. So right here is the density of states. And this density of state has electrons here. So that means that there's electrons here. So this is like counting electrons, right? So for instance, at this energy, the blue line says that I have a lot of electrons. And then this energy, I have less. And at this energy, I don't have any electron states. Make sense? That's what these blue lines are saying. So here there are no electron states when I use DFT in the PV version of it. And I can keep going. And basically when I look at my Fermi energy, when the energy is the same as the Fermi energy, you see that there, it tells me that there's energy states right here because it's not down here at zero. So this iron oxide is oxygen atoms and oxygen atoms in red and this uh, metallic looking ones is the iron atoms. And this is the unit cell for it. This also has like a hexagonal unit cell and it looks like this, periodic and so forth. So if I use normal DFT, which is this PVE flavor of it, we see that there, it's predicting that their energy states at the Fermi level, okay? But if I use a most expensive version of DFT, so this is harder to use, it's called PVE plus U. And what it does is that PVE plus U, you actually add a term to your Hamiltonian and the U value of it is something that you can tune in. And it's something that we use. We don't know the actual value to use. So we calibrate it with experiment. Does that make sense? So this is an extra knob that we added to the system. And if I tune that knob to the right value, I see that there's a bang up right here. So this yellow line, right? It goes from here to here, there's a bang up. So you guys see that this density of state tells me that between, I don't know, one, negative one, and maybe negative two, I don't have any electronic states. So that bang up right there tells me that iron oxide is not a metal, it's actually an insulator. 
And that's what the experiments showed you. Iron oxide is an insulator. In fact, it's an antiferromagnetic. So in iron by itself, all of the, um, in iron, imagine that all of the ions in iron have like a pointing up, pointing up. All of them are pointing up in magnetic properties, the electrons inside of it on average, right? For this iron oxide, one of the ions is up and the neighbors are down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So that makes them antiferromagnetic. And basically what I'm trying to tell you is that when we do our calculations, we actually don't know enough to do it right. And we have to compare with the experiment. And um, just from looking at this, DFT is not gonna solve all of the problems correctly. In fact, it predicts that iron oxide is a metal. So we have to be very careful when using theory to say whether something is gonna work or not. Questions? Yeah? I think that this works for both, uh, uh, both chemical, uh, both chemical formulae of uh, ferric oxide, no? For, for iron oxide. So this is one of the iron oxides, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if there's two of them. I'm not an expert in iron oxide. Right, uh, sorry, I was just thinking uh, because uh, there are two uh, prevalent uh, iron, iron ion Oh, so that would mean how much, how many bonds is making around itself. So in iron oxide, the one with the oxygen located like this pictures, your state, the valence state of the iron is gonna stay the same in the whole lattice. So I'm not sure if you would work for the other ones. I'm, I'm, I don't do calculations with iron, except for this one that I did to show you guys where it doesn't work. So yeah, I don't like iron. I don't like oxides. <laughs> They're a pain in the butt, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is carbon, right? So elemental atomic carbon is all the way on the left on A. You can see that it has usually well, it always has six protons right here. And there's different versions of carbon. Some of them has, have six neutrons. Some of them have seven neutrons. Some of them has eight neutrons. So the one that has eight neutrons is carbon 14 that's radioactive. And that's actually what they use to figure out how old something is, Car carbon 14 dating, right? They figure out how much that carbon is left over time because we know the lifetime of the carbon-14 isotopes. We can tell when this is stopped taking carbon in, when it stopped eating. So it's been dead this many thousands of years. So that's uh, the physical view of the Bohr version of the carbon atom. If we look at this energy, we have these two guys that are lower energy, the one is electrons. You have the two S electrons and the two P, two P electrons. And you have six orbital, no, yeah, you have six orbital, one, two, three, five orbitals in total, sorry. And you have one, two, three, four electrons right there. The one S ones don't do much. This one S ones are very close to the nuclei. They don't like to form chemical bonds that already fulfill, but these guys do. So what happens then when you take a atomic carbon, it would look like this in B. But then when you start looking at carbon, uh, oh yeah, let me go down here before. So when you look at the orbitals, the 2S1 is just a sphere. That 2px orbital looks like this in the x where you have a positive and a negative. That 2py is called py because the positive and the ne negative are oriented in the y direction. 
And then there's a 2PC. So if we had C coming out of the board, you would see a ball that is positive in the C direction and a negative one on the negative side of the C axis. So this guy, 2S, 2PX, and 2PY, and 2PC, they look like this. So then what happens is that that's what the carbon by itself would arrange your electrons in. But once you get carbon next to another carbon, then it starts making bonds that are different from, each, from that direction. And the way that it does that is that you start adding together orbitals. So this four guys, the orange and the yellow ones, they're close enough in energy that they actually can mix with each other, especially when you bring two carbons together. So here on C, right here in this portion right here, is what happens when you take these three orbitals and then they start joining together. So let me see if I can draw this on the screen. All right, and this one, okay. So we have an orbital that looks like this, okay? This is the 2S orbital. And then uh, let's assume we're gonna have this one right here. And this one looks like this and like this, okay? So if we assume that this is the x-axis, this is the 2px orbital. What happens when I add them together? Well, we see that, and this one I can also put the lines through it right here. If I look at the negative, I'm adding this one with this one, right? Negative X side of it. So those two would make something that looks like that. It's supposed to be symmetric. something that looks like this. And then if I look in the positive side, this one and this one, this side is positive and I'm gonna add negative to it. So then that one is gonna look maybe like this, a little tiny thing on the other side. Does that make sense? That's how hybridization happens. So you're adding those two orbitals together and then they look like that. All right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, this is still going. All right, so this is my hybridized orbitals. So you have a big blue and a little tiny orange over here. And those things is what you have that forms the bonds. So here you get that this sp2 orbital is the mixture of the 2s, 2p, and 2py orbitals. And they look like this. And that's the kind of bonding that happens. sp2 bonding happens right here in the graphite version of carbon. So it's the hybridization, the mixture of those two orbitals, the p versions of them and the s versions of them. So this is the graphite structure. And this bonds right here look like this, where you have this hybridized version of the XY with the, the PX, PY, and the S orbitals. And then you have the C orbitals that are by themselves pointing out of, the, of this plane down here. Questions?
So then this atom, for instance, this one right here is making bonds like this, is making bonds in three directions because you're having that this orbital, this orbital, and this orbital got added together. And you get this blob right here that wants to make three bonds in this direction, this direction, and this direction. So that's sp2 hybridization of the orbital. That's what happens to carbon. This is graphene. And here we have the hexagonal lattice that is the symmetry lattice that we have for it. All right, so before going into the next things, now I have to cover for you guys lattices and symmetries. So I'll come back to this in a bit. Questions? All right. So a quick review of what we covered last. So this is Brabe's lattice. So we covered this before. What a Brabe's lattice is, it's just a collection of points that you can put in two dimensions, in three dimensions and so forth, right? So in 3D, we have that the Brave's lattice is going to have, and this is the vector for it, is the set of points that go into this vector where we will have n1, a1, plus n2 times vector a2, n3 times vector a3. This n vector is this collection n1, n2, n3. This a1 is called the primitive vector. Primitive is the way that was chosen to give them to those primitive vectors. And then uh, this n1, n2, and n3 are just integers, right? So you have a triplet of integers. They can be any sign, plus, minus, doesn't matter. You have three vectors, a1, a2, and a3. They're primitive vectors. They have to be coplanar with each other. But whatever set of primitive vectors that you make, it's not unique. You can make different primitive vectors to describe your lattice. That's something I covered in, the pre in a previous class. Um, so the, the reason I'm putting it like this, Rn, right? Is that it also has a property. So for instance, if Rm and R n are both in the lattice, in the Brabe lattice, those are points that are described by the Brabe lattice. Those two are elements of the lattice, then they can, you can put R of little m plus minus n, doesn't matter if you use the plus or the minus one, you can, you can add the two vectors together or subtract the two vectors together. And you also have another point in the lattice. So the points in the lattice can be described like this, the three different versions of them. So finally, this we call lattice vectors. is in position space. The R is your lattice vectors. It describes how to go from one point in the lattice to another point in the lattice. So things that we need to remember, there's lattice 
description is an idealization of the system. If we have a crystal in our hands, it's not an infinite crystal. But the assumption here is that the crystal is infinite. So in math, you can have an infinite version of this crystal and it would be described by this and everything is nice and appropriate. All right, so this is how the, we describe the lattice. We also have some simple lattices that we talked about, the most famous lattice. In 3D, we have the simple cubic. And if we say the simple cubic lattice, we can describe it with the primitive vectors being whatever length x is. Second vector is a times y hat. And the third vector is c hat. So that's the simplest, the cubic lattice, right? Simple cubic lattice. We have other lattices and I printed this out to show it to you guys. Let me zoom in. out a little bit dry here all right so these are three different lattices that i brought in we have the simple cubic which is the one i just described a1 a2 a3 and we have um, the body center cubic and the face center cubic so this is face center cubic and this is body center cubic and those would be the primitive vectors that tell you A1, A2, and A3 for each of them. So for the face center cubic is the vectors that take you from one point into any other ones is the vectors that take you from this corner to this one right here. And this point is in the face in this plane. So it's not the same as this one to this one as in the cubic lattice because a vector that goes from here to here is not gonna take you to visit this point. Now, if you wanna visit from this point to this point, you can do it by linear combinations of A1, A2, and A3. So let me show you what those A1, A2, and A3 are. So we had the common lattice, the simple cubic, right there. If we're looking for the face center cubic, we have also three vectors. A1 is given by A over two, Y hat plus C hat. A2 is also A divided by two. The vector A2 is A divided by two, the length A. And this one is C hat plus X hat. And then A3, you can guess already. So this one has Y and C, this one has C and X. So this one must have X and Y, exactly. So for instance, if I wanna go um, straight up, right? In the X direction, let's say, I just have to do linear combinations of this guys, right? All three of them can get me there. There's different vectors that get you there. Questions? So that's, yeah. 
So for the body center, they're just more complicated combinations of those, but it's the same how to get those vectors. All right, questions about this? So if we look at the different lattices, the cubic lattice is the simple cubic is the same original structure. And then you decorate it by putting atoms, dots in our lattices, right? If we put, if we put these dots on the faces of, of our cube, we get the face center cubic in the center of the face. But we put the dots an extra dot in the middle of it, in the middle of the body of our cube, then we get the body center cubic. So that's how we're building them. Does that make sense? So here's a question for you guys. When I go to the face center cubic, I started with the simple cubic, right? So think about it like this. This is my cubic lattice, right? And I'm just putting one of the faces and right here in the middle of the face, I added an extra dot and I have the face center cubic. One's green, one is blue. The question for you guys, in this face center cubic, I'm only putting one of the facet of them. Is this added lattice point equivalent to the original ones? What do you guys think? Are they the same thing? Or are they different in the face center cubic version of, of this lattice? Hmm? You want to say they're different. You want to say they're the same. All right, let's do democracy here. Who votes for the same? Three, who votes for different? So we have four versus three. Casper, what did you vote? You're thinking they're the same. Okay, so democracy didn't work because we have a tie, they're actually the same. That's, that's the, the definition of the lattice, right? In this face center cubic, all the points are identical. And in the body center cubic, all the points are identical. And in the cubic world, that's obvious, right? They're identical, all of them. So they're the same, they have that if you go with the R vector, you can go, by this definition of the A's, this primitives vectors, you can go from any point to any point in this whole lattice. Okay? All right, so... Another point is that every one of these points in each of the Brabe's lattice has the same number of neighbors. So let me bring this up again. And let's look at, for instance, a cubic lattice. So if we take one of the points, right? Remember that this is periodic and, and goes in all directions. Let's count how many neighbors this guy's gonna have. We have one quadrant here basically, right? So we have one, two, three identical neighbors. Right? This point right here is too far away. So it's not identical. And this one and this one are not identical to this one, this one, and this one, because these two are farther away. So if we look at this, we have one in the positive x direction. So there's one in the positive x. There has to be one in the negative x, right? Because it's periodic. We have one up in the c direction one down in the C direction. We have one going in in the Y direction. 
we must have one on this other direction. So we take a simple cubic lattice and count the number of neighbors around it. How many did we get? Six neighbors, perfect. So that's the simple cubic has six neighbors around it. You can do the same for each of these guys. So we have the number of neighbors is six for this guy. And if we look at the number of neighbors for this face center cubic, that if we actually have 12. Yep. Exactly. So this one has 12. And this one has eight identical points near it. Okay, so six, 12, and eight. Does that make sense? How to count them? And you can do it, you can build your lattice yourself and count them, right? So the number of neighbors is important. because it gives you, gives you uh, so every point in the Bravais lattice has the same number of neighboring points. And this number is called the coordination number. Coordination is something that you have probably heard before. In this case, it tells us how many directions are our closest neighbors. Simple cubic, we already saw that is six. And if we look at the face center cubic, you're gonna find so usually it's given by a C value, like uh, the letter C for the simple cubic, uh, the face center cubic, and the body center cubic. So this is six, 12, and eight. So for elements, for, ele for uh, systems that make, for systems that make for materials that are made of simple elements, not alloys, but simple things. Like for instance, if we talk, took a chunk of iron crystal, silicon crystal, things like that, elemental materials, most of them like to be in either FCC or BCC lattices. Why is that? Because they like to make eight have a coordination number each of the atoms around it they like to have either 12 or eight it's a lot cheaper in energy wise to have this many neighbors than to just have six so a few compounds and compounds have multiple elements don't even form um, a broad based lattice by having each of the points on the lattice being points in your Brabe's lattice. So we're gonna get to that in a little bit. But for elemental systems, they mostly like to be in this too. There's a few things in nature that like to be in the simple cubic. So for instance, if you take uh, salt, salt is a crystal, right? It's made out of chlor chlorine and sodium. Salt likes to be simple cubic crystal. So that's because it's an ionic compound. 
So it likes being in cubic form. But a lot of the elements that you would see like gold, things like that, uh, like to be with a larger coordination number instead of just six. So that makes FCC and BCC lattice more common. Um, so why is it that for elemental compounds, we get this, right? And we can describe it like that. But for alloys that have two different or more elements, maybe three elements, maybe four elements, you have to have, you don't even have a bra base lattice for all of the atoms. How could we talk about this, right? What does that mean? So if we look at, um, at a, another kind of system, I have defined the lattices, right, already. So now, so that one was Brabe lattices. Now let's go into Brabe's lattices with bases. So this basis is a new concept, okay? So the Brabe's lattice is a mathematical object and it's not the physically the crystal yet, it's just a collection of points. So Brave lattices are mathematical objects. Physical crystals, like for instance, if you have a diamond, right? If you have quartz, have a corresponding Brave slides. So for instance, if I have something like this, where all of the blue dots are identical atoms, we already can tell that what is the crystal for this system, right? If it's two dimensional, is just a square lattice, right? So we know that if they're identical atoms. In fact, let me give you, so here, um, this is a one, and this one right here is a two. So these are identical atoms. Let me, I forgot to give you a definition before starting with the basis stuff. So just consider this bra base lattice right here. So we talked about how this A1 and A2 are not unique and all of that. We can make a cubic, a cube out of here and put it anyway. And we all agree a square right here. If it's the right A size, we can agree that that's our basis, right? That's our bra base lattice. And that's the unit of repetition. But now if I ask each of you to do it, I could get eight different ones where some of you might put the unit cell centered in one atom, right? Some of you might put it a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. You have a infinite way of putting that. So the convention for figuring out where the unit cell goes like this, we see, let's do it for this guy, right? Here we see that there's a neighbor. Let me start 
in this direction. So there's a neighbor between here and here. If I look through it, this is the plane in between the neighbor, between this guy and this guy, right? And I can do the same thing between this guy and this guy. There's a line right there that separates them. This is the line of the equidistant between this point in the center and this point up in the corner. And I can do that for all the neighbors here. This one is gonna go right through here. Then I have another one going through here, this neighbors. This one is gonna be through here. Then from here to here, there's this one. From he here to here, there is this line. From here to here, there is this line. So now, by definition, I just built the cubic lattice right here. You guys see that cubic lattice? That one is called the Wigner. Wigner sites unit cell. So this is the convention of how you draw, and this is the cubic, sorry, the square cell, not cubic, it's not three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. So this is the definition that you would find that people agree with, and this is the convention of showing how for this crystal, this is the cube, the square cell. And that means that that point goes right on the center and you will have another Wigner side cell around each of the different atoms. Make sense? So that's by definition how people do it. Questions? Yes, no? No? All right. So for instance, let me do another one, just like this one. This is hard to do. So the one that I have here is a triangular lattice, right? Like you can tell that there's this shape right here. So you can see the triangle or lattice in there, right? So for this triangular lattice, um, if we take yeah, if we take this point right here. So there's gonna be, so between those two guys, this one and this one, there's gonna be a line going through here. Between those two guys, there's a line going through here. Between those two guys, there's a line going through here. Between those two guys, there's a line going through here. Between those two guys, there's a line going through here. Between those two guys, there's a line going through here. Between those two guys, there's a line going through here. Okay. So there's, it's easier for, for you to see if you take like a square or dotted paper and do it on your own with rulers and everything. But if we do that, we see that there's actually, yeah, I messed it up. <laughs> it's hexagonal. So this is half done dry and it's a hexagonal lattice. So this is the triangular lattice.
And this is the unit cell. And it's a, you, can take, you can see now that this is a hexagonal Wigner sides unit cell. So I didn't draw it right because I don't have a ruler with me, but it, would, it should look like a hexagon. All right, any questions up to here? So now let's get into lattice and to Brabe's lattices with bases. So what happens if you have more than one atom or more? So, so we look at this one, right? This one is one atom inside of this unit cell. And then all the other unit cells have only one atom. If we look at this one, there's a hexagon here. And this guy is also going to be surrounded by hexagons. So this is where you can see this hexagon tiles the whole thing. And there's only one dot in that hexagon, one atom. So what happens if you have more than one or unit cell. How would you be able to describe this guys, right? So now we have our old friend, this vector R. And before we said that we could describe anybody with this little N on it, right? So this were the little vectors, the integer vectors that go with this one, 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 it could be whatever, right? Now this R, is going to be accompanied by another integer here. And this integer is S. And the definition now becomes that we have the original vector N, R of N, plus some new vector tau of S. So now this is a Brabe lattice with a basis. All right, so S can be one, two, up to whatever number M, and this is the number of additional atoms in the unit cell. Does that make sense? Yeah, with alloys, exactly. Where you have more than one atom per unit cell, if you have three atoms in your unit cell, then you would have to describe the position of those atoms. You have the original one, and then you have two more vectors that tell you where those two additional guys are. Yep. Does that make sense? All right, so then let me show you the most famous one of all. Well, not really. Let's go back over here. Share the screen. There we go. So this is the graphene unit cell. This is graphene. If all of this black and white dots are all carbon, this is graphene. So you see that this looks like chicken wire, right? If all of the atoms are the same and they're all carbon, this is graphene. So here we have two of the vectors, the primitive vector, this is two dimensional, so it only requires two vectors. Here's A1 and here's A2. Here we're putting it at this point and you see that this is the unit cell that we have. 
Okay, so this is the unit cell. This little diamond right here is the unit cell. And you know that that's the unit cell because if you take this figure, this rhomboidal and copy paste it everywhere, you're gonna see that you can tile the whole of the graphene network that we have there. Make sense? So now we see that at the center of this guy, there's nothing, so there's no point in here, but we have this Delta one. So if we made this a unit cell, we said the position of A is gonna tell us the white dots is the, you, we could make that the white dots are your bra base lattice and the black dots are your bases. So then this delta one is the extra vector that we would need. This delta one is this tau vector that we need to go to the next direction. And in fact, this one, you could have this as your unit cell center around A1, it would just get shifted and so forth, but there's different ways to make the unit cell, right? So that's our bra base lattice with a basis. Um, so this is also called the honeycomb lattice. And the original version of this guy, the, the triangular lattice, the one that we just did with the hexagons is, you could tell that's the bra base lattice. Because you see that the hexagons are here. There's a hexagon here, there's a hexagon here, and the hexagon gives you the unit cell of that system. Except at the center of the hexagon, there's no atoms. So now you have to describe how do I get to those two atoms in the center of my hexagon? All right. So that's all the time that I have here. Any questions before we go? All right. So then for next class, it's going to be freezing cold outside. You guys know this? Have you checked the weather? It's going to be rainy. So it's going to be rainy today. And then the following day is going to be really cold tonight. The following day, Wednesday, there might be some snow, but they're predicting that Thursday is going to be terrible. I want you to stay safe and um, don't travel. There's going to be ice on the roads and we're going to do the class online. And if you're not able to attend, let's say you lost internet at your house or something, don't worry about it. I'll put the video up on the, on the Canvas site. Okay, questions? No, online on Thursday. Huh? Online on Thursday. Right. I mean, in person. If we're not meeting in person on Thursday, what will we be doing about the network? You're turning it in, in by uploading it to Canvas. So your your homework, you take uh, some app or something and scan your homework and then just upload that as a PDF into Canvas. Okay? You don't have to turn it in. In fact, I don't want you to turn it in because that way you get to keep it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a problem with the internet on Thursday and you just turn it in whenever you get internet back or you're back on campus. So don't worry about that. I want you to stay safe. Don't drive if you don't need to. Make sure you buy your supplies today all the stakes that you need to survive until Thursday night, right? All right, any questions? All right, so if you have problems with the homework, uh, you have any issues, remember I'm having office hours tomorrow too, and I can be online or in person, okay? All right. Yeah, they're on the website. See you, Casper.